If you're like most video makers, you shoot a lot of footage. And while you may enjoy watching every raw second of it, most people aren't going to. That's what we're here to talk about today, is how to make your video footage worth watching with editing. Now the basics of editing is locating the scenes that you like on your playback VCR and recording them on a record VCR. That's all there is to it. Uh, once you do that, once you hook all the equipment together, you can use the playback and record button on the pieces, two pieces of equipment. You can use remote control devices, or in some cases, there are some units that allow you to control two devices from one piece of hardware. But the first step is hook it all together. And all of us will come back to our homes with source footage that we got from our camcorder, and all camcorders have some way to get the video signal out of it. It's just a little trickier on some. Now this is the best case scenario. This camcorder has actual audio and video output jacks right on it. Other camcorders, like this one, use a proprietary connector that you either have to have with you on the shoot or you bring it home. If this is lost or broken, you're out of luck because this jack here has special connectors that you can't use with normal cables. And most companies don't agree together on any kind of standard there, so there's a few a few companies that works together, a few companies where it does not. Back to our more standard camcorder. Now in this case, since it's a high band stereo camcorder, we have left and right audio signals up here. We have a yellow jack for composite video output and down here a special S-video connector. Now because this is Hi8, it has the S-video jack that allows you to have higher video quality if you're recording to a high band VCR. We're going to go ahead and connect it with the standard composite output because that's what most people will be using. So it's as simple as taking your cables, which are usually color-coded exactly the same as the jacks on the camcorder, which is yellow, composite video, red, right audio, and white, left audio. Now if you do decide to use the higher quality video signal, the S cable, you'd have to use uh, this special kind of a connector. In that case, you would certainly would want to disconnect the RCA yellow connector, which is the standard video connector. But in all cases, you do need to connect the audio cables. Now, in the back of the record VCR, you simply reverse the process and go to video input. There's our yellow composite video jack, red, right audio, white left audio, and other than attaching a monitor, you're finished with the basic video connection. To connect the monitor, you take the audio and video outputs from your record VCR and connect yellow to the video input on your television, and if you have a stereo TV, you use white for the left audio and again red for the right audio. Now if you have an older style television, you may not have any of these input jacks. In that case, you'll need to use the RF input. Every television has this RF input down here. It's used for plugging in an antenna or taking a cable signal. In this case, you simply plug the VHF cable into the back of the television and go to the VHF output on the record VCR. Then you see your video by tuning the TV to either channel 3 or channel 4. Now the RF signal or the radio frequency signal has some shortcomings and you really want to avoid at all costs using that to actually send the video signal that you're recording with. But for monitoring purposes, it's just fine. In fact, if you want to have a more advanced editing setup where you've got a monitor on your record VCR and a monitor on your playback VCR, in most cases you're forced to use an RF jack. In some new VCRs, there's actually two video outputs for the RCA connector. But that's the basis of how to hook it all up. It's been said that cinema, or in your case video making, is real life with all the boring parts edited out. And now that you know the basics of editing, you can pull out all those boring parts and your friends and family will thank you. Alright, welcome to our segment on editors. We're here with Dave Welton, uh, one of our writers, and he's an instructor in video technology. Hi Dave. Hi Matt. Um, Let's see, we're going to talk about editors, and I think that maybe the first thing is try to define what an editor is. I know that some manufacturers use the phrase editors to describe products that they sell, but I, there may be some doubt about whether or not they live up to the definition, so maybe you can you know, talk about that a little bit. Okay, well the, the key thing is to think of editors as edit controllers, and the key emphasis is on the word control. What we want to be able to do is um, to take over the operation of the, of the VCRs and the camcorders, all the different things that are linked together for, for our edit system. But I guess this is one of the more, most simplest editors, and this one actually does take control of the VCRs? This one does take control of the VCRs. The whole idea behind this unit is simplicity, and you can tell by the, the fact that there aren't a whole lot of buttons on it that uh, this machine is definitely an easy one to use. Um, the whole idea is to push the thumbs up button for scenes that you want to keep, and the thumbs down button for scenes you'd rather never see again. Um, it it uh, 
takes advantage of the Control L protocol, which is the, the protocol used with the 8 millimeter family. Both high 8 and 8 millimeter camcorders and VCRs use that. Dave, I wanted to talk with you about how the uh, VCRs and camcorders are controlled by these little decks. Um, I'm sure we use cables, and uh, I've always found it to be fascinating how inconsistent the industry is with a lack of standardized formats. So let's take them one at a time. I think one of the most primitive uh, protocols that is, you know, languages that, that machines talk to each other with in the, in the consumer level editing realm is SyncroEdit. Right, right. SyncroEdit is mostly found in the VHS family of VCRs and camcorders and it's more or less a remote pause sort of an affair where one machine tells the other machine to come off pause at a certain moment and start recording and then go back on pause at another moment in time. I see and what kind of jacks does the, the synchro use? That uses a uh, mini jack with uh, just a two, two conductor uh, plug. The next uh, more advanced uh, protocol is Control S, is that right? Control S is an older version of Control L, which we'll talk about real soon. But first, Control S uh, is a one way communication system. It's more or less a wired remote control sort of an affair, but it also allowed you to uh, enter in and out points where you wanted your actual edit to take place, and then it would execute them at that moment. But the problem with Control S was it was a one way communication system. There still was no feedback from the uh, machine to machine. So it was just sending a command down a wire and hoping that everything went well, but not having any feedback to know if indeed it did go well. Uh, by the way, Dave, what kind of jack does uh, Control S use? Control S uses a mini mono jack, which is just a connector like this with a ring and tip. Same thing as Synchro, then? Right. Same D different information, same jack. Right, That's right. You cannot intermix the signals, definitely, because the, the Synchro edit signal is just basically a, a on-off kind of a switch, where Control S is much more complex than that, because you are sending information, rewind, fast forward, pause, all sorts of things. But what can you tell us about Control L? It's a great, it's a great format or a great protocol, I should say. Um, it not only is the name confusing, but unfortunately, though, the, some of the wires it uses are a little bit confusing as well. Uh, first, I'll show you what kinds of connectors it uses. It uses a stereo or a three uh, conductor a mini jack here. Uh, it also uses a five-pin proprietary jack. Uh, an additional uh, protocol is manufactured by or pioneered by Panasonic. Right. It's a five-pin jack of some type. And is, it, is, is the name of the jack and the protocol the same thing, Panasonic five-pin? Yes, that's pretty much what it's referred to as a five-pin. It uses a standard five-pin DIN, which is the five-pin DIN really describes the, the connector itself. I see. Uh, but uh, the name is also the same. Uh, what this is a system that's proprietary with Panasonic that allows uh, also two-way communication from machine to machine. But I guess we're going to head into the computer okay. control room now. Okay. All right, so I'd imagine one of the one of the beauties of using a computer-based editing system is just to unify all of the jacks and the protocols into one processor in a computer, and it will send the appropriate signals to different hardware choices that you may have. That's, that's very true, Matt. Um, Usually the, even a software, there can be a software solution to different protocols and new equipment too. You could have a, a new VCR come out with a new protocol and all they have to do is come up with a new driver in order to, uh, to have the, the same equipment be used. So this one here, the TAO editizer, looks like it's comprised of a piece of hardware that's that's sh normally uh, cabled to a computer, to right. a PC in this case, mm -hmm. and then uh, some software that um, uh, this is, I think, a Windows-based system that makes a real nice user interface, very much like I guess the uh, products we we're looking at in the other room. I think going down from in complexity from the editizer, we've got a uh, future video has right. instead of a, an external piece of hardware, there's a, a card in here that goes into a, a PC based system and uh, the jacks come in and out of here. This uses no infrared control though, I think this is limited strictly to all hard wiring control mm. and uh, it's got some software and a user interface that would that would be, I don't think, I think, think it's quite as attractive as this one, but I believe they're working on a, on a Windows-based editor. I guess that about wraps it up. I would really encourage anybody who's out there frustrated trying to figure out which piece of hardware is compatible with which other piece of hardware and 
what exactly a protocol is to really, you know, keep your determination up, talk to as many salespeople and uh, company representatives as you, as you can. It, it, it can be done, and editing is a lot of fun once you get over the initial obstacle of trying to figure out which hardware works with each other. So thanks a lot for being with us today, Dave. My pleasure, Matt. How about talking about the aesthetics of editing today? The aesthetics of editing, I'll sure thing. I'll sit, I'll sit down with you. Um, one thing that um, I know most people who are in their beginning stages have to deal with is uh, the infamous glitch, which due to new features like flying erase hits and all that has been diminished. But still, um, at the fundamental level of the aesthetics of editing, um, maybe you can describe for the folks at home the difference between types of edits, and ones that lead to glitches and ones that don't. Sure. Uh, with VHS or, or SVHS video formats, you have to think about the control track. And it's a little bit like an electronic version of the sprockets that are on film. When you do what's called an assemble edit, you are laying down both new video information and new control track. If you get to an end, the end of an edit, the control track ends. If your if your tape is playing through that section, it's going to, like you said, glitch because the control information is gone. The sprocket holes are gone. An insert edit, on the other hand, just replaces the video information and leaves the control track the same. I'll come right over here. Now I'm going to play a little bit yeah, into this just tape. Got here. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, now I'm going to pause it right here, and what we're going to do is we're going to do. Just go into the record mode from a camcorder we have set up just to our right. So when I hit pause here, this is actually being recorded onto the tape. I see. Okay, now I'm going to hit stop. This is simulating an assemble edit. I see. Now if we play this back, we're going to see the video, and yep. at the end is the glitch that you spoke of. I see. Now, let me contrast that. Whoa, we still got more. Okay, so it was struggling to regain the sync because the I control see. track was stopped. Okay, so if I hit stop here now and press play, you'll see that the end of that edit is clean mm -hmm. because the control track was unaffected. There we go. I see. We came in and right back out again. I see. The insert versus assemble editing. Mm -hmm. Apart from the electrical characteristics of editing, you need to understand that there's kind of a, a grammar of edits. Certain edits over time have come to mean certain things. Now, the straight cut often just conveys a, a change of angle. It may not have anything to do with the change of location or a change of time. It's very common. It just tends to fly right by, and we don't even notice straight cut edits anymore. Uh, another transition is called a dissolve, where one image is replaced by another. That can often convey a change of location and, and no change of time. Fade to black often conveys a passage of time. It can be anything from a few seconds to even years. You've seen a, a fade to black and a fade back to the image where it says, you know, 20 years later or March 16th, 1993. So it can convey a passage of time. All right, how's it going, Lauren? Oh, hi. Uh, so we're back here. Remember that segment we did earlier today? We really need to wrap it up now. Oh, so this must be later that day. Yeah, this is the uh, end of that, that okay. scene. Um, all right, Lawrence. So what else? What are some of the other basic building blocks or concepts in, uh, in editing? Continuity is an extremely important thing to keep in mind. Uh, continuity has to do with making sure that action is conveyed smoothly, that objects that weren't there in one scene uh, don't magically appear in another. Well, why don't we go to a, um, a segment now that we'll produce or that you'll produce to demonstrate these things in a better way. Okay, yeah, we're going to show a few examples of, of how to keep continuity and pacing in mind when you're doing your editing. We're going to go ahead and do that now. There is a continuity problem with it, and I want to challenge our viewers to catch it. I'll give you a hint. Wardrobe. Okay, John, come on and follow me. We're on a quest. Okay, I'm going to step through the door here. Then we're going to come back and shoot a cutaway. And we're going to be careful when we edit this down to match the action so it looks like one continuous scene. Okay, you ready? Step on through. Okay, now John, go ahead and get another angle of me coming through the door. Okay, I'm going to step through and hope I do everything the same for the sake of continuity. Well, that's probably close enough. Okay, now I'm out of the frame and we're back. That gives us plenty of options for editing. Hey, Lewis. All right. And here is the goal, the drinking fountain. Okay, now we're going to get a close-up of my hands on the handle. Set everything up the same here. Okay, now let's switch angles. All right, going to come in and do it one more time. 
And we're done. Okay, John. One more. Whew. I'm not thirsty anymore. Okay, I'm going to walk out of the frame again. Sets us up for another edit. We're going to head on down the hallway again. Okay. Step through the door, right hand on the handle. Got to remember that. Okay, we're going to do another close up, do a match action edit so it all links up. Okay. All right, now John's going to swing through and we're going to get one last shot. All right, almost back to the desk. And we're back. Now we're going to edit that all together and see how it looks. In creating titles, as in life, follow this advice. Choose your words carefully. You must decide what the words will be. We can make some suggestions on where to put them and why. I'm Dave Richardson, and welcome to Titling with Style. Let's take a look at a video short and pay close attention to the use of titles. This graphic sets the mood for the show. Titles identify content. Obviously, During interviews, superimpose the person's name and title. Desire to be taken from the familiar surroundings. During another interview, a dog attempts to communicate with a viewer. Subtitles can be used to translate. If you have a location shot and there's no real way to identify the place, use a title to clear up the mystery. After the final dog has been napped, the show is over. Now it's time for the credits. These people worked hard and the viewer needs to know who they are. Decent graphics can be made without spending a lot of money. You can pick up press-on lettering from any art supply store. This method is labor intensive because you not only have to rub each letter into place, you also need to apply the letters in a straight line. This is harder than it sounds. Have patience. If press-on sounds like too much work, try a laser printer. Most quick print shops feature lots of different type styles and can whip up a title in seconds. Don't limit yourself to black titles on white paper, especially if shooting directly with a camera. While at the art supply store, check out the selection of papers. You'll see paper that looks like stone or marble, graduated sheets that start as one color, then gradually change into another, and paper with grids and patterns. Don't just use letters from established type styles. Go nuts! If you're taping a commercial for an Italian restaurant, create a script-style title using cooked spaghetti. For a show with a military flavor, use stencils and spray paint letters onto wood, like on MASH. Spell out a message in a bowl of alphabet soup for a public service announcement on nutrition. Electronic graphics are effective and the most widely used. These are titles created inside your camcorder or on an external device like a character generator. Character generators, or CGs, come in two main styles, standalone systems and computer software. With a character generator, your video goes in one end, the titles you created are superimposed on top, then the video, complete with titles, comes out the other end. The character generator can make the text scroll or roll up the screen like end credits, crawl or move from side to side like ticker tape, dissolve in and out, and wipe on and off. Keep continuity in mind when using fonts. Don't use a dozen different type styles just because you have them. White letters on a black background, or vice versa, offers the highest contrast. Those same white letters would vanish if keyed over a picture of a light blue sky. 
you can wrap a black border around them or make them darker to regain the contrast. When composing titles for the screen, you need to think about aspect ratio and safe title areas. Because your screen is three units high by four units wide, your title shouldn't stray far from the aspect ratio of three to four. You can assume that about 10% of what you see in the viewfinder will get lost by the time it gets to a monitor. This is called home cutoff. To be really safe, titles should only use the middle 80% of the screen. This safe area will keep the characters from bleeding off the edge. How long should titles remain on the screen? If you're identifying a person who's talking, or a super is conveying information you want the audience to read, then the title should stay on the screen long enough to read it out loud twice. Titles are a tool. When used properly, titles add another dimension to video, identifying speakers, reinforcing the audio, giving credit where credit is due. Titles can also be distracting or just plain ugly. And Dinwiddie, Delaware is no place for a dog to roam alone. But you already knew that. Hello and welcome to the desktop video segment of the Video Maker TV show. I'm Lauren Aldrin and I'll be your guide as we demystify one of desktop video's most common hardware devices, the Genlock. Using a computer to overlay graphics or insert titles on top of video may provide the most visual impact for the smallest DTV investment. In this segment we'll learn all about the device that makes this possible and along the way we'll pick up a few hints on how to apply the Genlock to your next video production. Mixing video signals and computer graphics is not as easy as, say, mixing audio signals. Whereas any two audio sources to be combined can simply be placed on the same wire, video sources first require perfect synchronization. In other words, if one video source is conveying visual information from the middle of the screen or is instructing the electron beam to return invisibly to the top, any other video source to be combined with it must be at the exact same spot. Here's a simplified look at a computer's video signal versus an NTSC signal. Not only are these two systems operating at different scan rates, the computer video in this example is non-interlaced. This means that the computer draws every scan line consecutively, whereas the NTSC system alternately scans every other line. To overlay computer graphics on video, the Genlock has to perform two very important tasks. The first we've already talked about, and that is synchronizing the computer's graphic output with the incoming video. This usually requires slowing down the computer's scan rate and converting its output to an interlaced signal. The only exception to this is the Amiga computer, whose output requires no such conversion. Second, the Genlock superimposes the graphic signal onto the video. Now this is where the magic occurs. The Genlock looks at each pixel before it's displayed. If that pixel is of a specific color, it's simply not written to the screen. Where pixels aren't displayed, the video source shines through. Titles or graphics not containing this special disappearing color will appear on top of the video when the signals are combined. In a nutshell, that's how all Genlocks operate. Where they differ is in areas of color accuracy, quality of the final output signal, how well they sync to a less than perfect video input, and the advanced features they offer. Some Genlocks have the capability to fade either of the video sources in or out. Others just have a simple switch to select the computer graphics, the input video, or the two combined. Some put all these features under software control. Depending on the quality and the features offered, Genlocks are available for most computer systems for well under $1,000. Because it has to do less processing, some Amiga Genlocks are available for as low as $200. Now, melding computer graphics and video may seem simple, but there are some shortcomings of this transfer that you need to know about. First and foremost, the NTSC system is not as adept at handling color as your computer is. Bright, highly saturated tones that may look fine on your computer monitor are going to bleed and smear when translated to video. Bright reds and yellows like these need to be cooled off before they're translated. Simply adjust the palette, bringing down the saturation until the bleeding stops. Or you could select another color altogether. Second, all computers but the Amiga output an underscanned image. This means the outermost edges of the graphic fall inside the borders of your monitor. NTSC video requires an overscanned image, or one whose outermost edges fall outside the visible portion of the monitor. 
Because of this, most genlocks will have to stretch your image. This can change the proportions of your graphic dramatically or make portions of it disappear completely. The key with any computer system is to avoid the outermost edges of the screen. Stay inside what broadcasters call the safe title area. The third factor to bear in mind is NTSC's limited resolution. This makes small fonts very hard to read and reduces fine detail in an image. If your title or graphic relies on these fine details to make its point, it's not going to work on video. Look at how much more effective these large, bold fonts are. And lastly, be aware of interlace flicker. This occurs when horizontal lines are small enough to be completed by just one scan of the monitor. Since the line appears in only one of the two NTSC fields, it's on the screen only half of the time, and it will visibly flicker on and off. Use a line two or three pixels wide whenever possible. All these gremlins can be caught in their infancy if you make it a point to regularly monitor your work on a properly set up NTSC display or television. Consult it regularly for color choices, title placement, legibility, even interlace flicker. If you've already seen your work in its final form, there should be no surprises. Professional looking titles like anything else take a lot of practice to get down. Remember that every time you turn on your television, you have an opportunity to see how the pros compose their titles. Turn on your television, watch, and learn. I'm Lauren Aldrin for the Video Maker TV Show. Thanks for joining me. Hi, welcome to our segment on special effects generators coming to you from the basement studios of Video Maker. We're here with Dave Welton. Hi, Matt. How's it going, Dave? Good. And we're going to talk about SEGs. These are devices that allow people to make professional level effects with relatively affordable products. Here's a couple of units here. This one's a little more, the bigger they are usually, the more bang you get for your buck, even though it has nothing to do with what goes on inside there. But maybe 400 bucks up to 1300 bucks, something like that. Um, one of the first things that we're going to do, Dave's going to be the master here, is fade to black. Okay. Kind of do at the end of a show and say, okay, goodbye. There, or fade from black, saying, oh, here we are. We're here to, to open up a show for you. Also, now we've got, now that could be done in a camcorder, right, Dave? Could be done in the camcorder, but the beauty of this special effects generator, using it in post-production, is that we can do that effect after the shoot and determine exactly where we want it to happen. How could, can you demo with the special effects generator a basic dissolve where you go from one and mix it slightly with another? There we go. This happens all the time. This shows passage of time or sometimes, meanwhile, back at the ranch kind of effect. Now, one of my favorites, for, pioneered, I think, by the Flash Gordon movies I keep thinking about, is a wipe, where you have both video on the, there it is, the same time, on the same screen at the same time, where there's a vertical wipe. But also, there are so many different wipe patterns these days. There are, it's like man. Whatever you really want to do, there's a, I don't know what you would call that, but it's coming out of the bottom there. You can use uh, circles and things like we that, I guess. reverse it. Or reverse. Um, I guess, you know, there are interesting applications for such a thing, but that's, that's, that's your basic one there. Uh, there's, now there's... Uh, now, the, what do you call this? Is picture in a picture? That's I a guess, picture right? in picture. Huh? Yes, it is. So well, there we go. I just reversed it. There's That'll reverse it. The corner. That's mm -hmm. kind of neat. A little bit more grainy, but boy, that's really right. something. We can actually bounce ourselves around like that. It does lose a little, a little resolution when you do that. Yeah, look at that. That's really high tech, you know. Okay. Now, some of the MTO oh, is a little smaller. Oh, we got one smaller. Yeah, it happened by mistake, huh? Well, okay. Now let's go to an effect that uh, you see a lot on MTV, which is a strobe effect. Where that, there we go. See, Madonna can do a lot more justice to that than we can, but you can kind of get the effect there. Now, how about still, where you actually just freeze it? See, we got Dave's finger just stuck on there. We're still moving, I can promise you that, but we're stuck there. We'll release that back to, oh, there we go. All right, that's kind of a neat one. <laughs> how about, uh, what do we got here? Mosaic. This Mosaic. is another one I think that is kind of like, I don't know, I don't really know why someone would want that, but if you want it, there it is. But you can, I think when you're trying to hide someone's identity, you know how to do that? Let's see if we can get that going, Matt. That let's takes a little bit more work to get all the buttons in the right position, but let's see if we can't. One thing I should mention is there's a lot of buttons on this machine, yeah, and you sometimes... Just kind of plow a try, huh? Okay, we're getting close. There we all go. All right, now we want to just reverse that, so we want the strobe... Or there the we go. There, there we go. And you can actually make it a little smaller, and you can say, "Oh, who's that guy there trying to trying to learn how to run this thing?" It must be Dave. Right? There you go. But and you can see you can change the size of the blocks in yeah. the mosaic pattern. I mean, what would life be at? Would life without being able to change the, say, change the size of those blocks, right? <laughs> okay. Let's move on to paint. This okay. is another kind of MTV effect here, where. By the way, we're painting inside We're painting the just inside the circle. Let's oh, turn yeah. the circle off and so you can get the, the full screen effect. There we go. I see. So 
I mean, I guess it looks better when there's more colorful things going on in the background, but there's mm -hmm. different levels that I see. Now, there's also a keying effect that we can combine with that here. That's right. And there we go. Look at that. That's kind of neat. It can actually change the colors. We can change on that. the color. Look at that yellow. It's look, look at that. It would look kind of like a. Like now what it's doing, Matt, is it's taking the really dark parts of the image and just inserting a different color that we've selected here, in this case the green, on those areas of, of dark picture. Look at that. That's really neat. This is like, uh, this one here reminds me of us being like a couple of Santa Clauses. <laughs> yes. Right? All right, now let's see. Any other effects we overlooked here at all? Those, those are, that covers the basics, I guess. I guess the key thing is to get out there and try it before you buy, because literature just doesn't cut it here. Because you know, if you're going to try to, you know, spend that much money, you know, you know, you just can't really expect to know know the product before you try it. So that's about it for our SEG segment. Thanks for being with us, Dave. Thank you, Matt. Welcome to our segment on post-production audio. On this beautiful spring morning, we're with Lauren Aldrin, the technical editor of Video Maker Magazine. How's it going today, Lauren? It's fine. I'm a little distracted over here playing with my audio toys, but... Now, where did those birds come from? Those were actually off an LP. You might remember what these look like. Um, most sound effects libraries are now available on compact disc, but this is this was the rage. This is what everybody used for a long time. I transferred them onto DAT or digital audio tape to make them easier to cue, but there's no reason you couldn't either use them right off the LP or transfer them onto a normal audio cassette. So I noticed that you've got an audio mixer here. Um, I guess that's so you can take CD or a tape or even another VCR's audio or a LP and bring them into one source so you can just have one cable going to the VCR. Exactly. Um, instead of using a, a patchwork of Y cables, which is never really a good idea, um, an audio mixer allows you to take a number of different inputs and control their volume. In addition to that, this one allows some simple bass and treble equalization controls. It can crossfade between two sources. There's even a microphone input for narration. So you really have a lot of control. This is like, this is like your audio editor. I think the trend nowadays with SEGs is that they usually encompass some type of audio mixing capability in them as well. That's becoming a lot more common. Uh, many video mixers have a small audio mixing uh, section, like you said. They don't offer quite as much control as this, but then you have everything in one box. It's just very convenient. So what kind of effects, uh, sound effects, would one think about adding to their audio, their post-production, just to, uh, to change the, the atmosphere? Well. I guess it depends on what you want to do. If you want to try and sus suspend disbelief, as we call it, and um, make the viewers believe that I've, I've had a fireplace installed, all I have to do is bring in the roar of a crackling fire and, and we can warm our hands right down here. If we didn't have all this audio editing equipment around, we might be able to get people to believe that we're sitting in a cafeteria or a bar by adding the right sound effects. Now, in addition to sound, a sound, so what, what, what can be done? It's okay, Rex. It, it's, it's Matt. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, what, can, what can be done with music? What kind, of, what kind of things can music do for a video production? Well, it can completely change the, the mood. I would say more than anything else, music has the capability of, of just changing the way your emotions perceive a given event. Now, Lauren, the best best way maybe to demonstrate all these techniques would be if we can take that segment you did earlier today and show how different types of audio tracks can actually affect it very differently. Sure. Yeah, John and I went out and shot a little event that basically means nothing until you have the audio bed behind it. Here's what we did. This is just the natural sound of the, of the environment we were in. In this case, the actor comes up, myself, and we have an action. Without the audio, there's really no way to know what it is. So here's what it looks like with music and sound effects. This is one possible motivation for what I do. Running to grab the phone. So here's another way to interpret the same event. Very, very different, obviously. Yeah, and, and one, this one's kind of silly. This is your urban jungle theme. Wow. 
so with different audio and different music, you can completely change the whole effect of a given event. Audio dubbing is an overlooked uh, resource for people making video. Um, can you give us you know, any closing tips on how someone could, could get the most amount of mileage out of this feature? Well, the main thing to do is keep in mind that our ears are actually closer tied to our emotions than our eyes are. It, it's easier to paint a feeling or create an ambiance with sound than it is with the visuals. If, uh, if a picture is worth a thousand words, then sound and music are probably worth a thousand pictures. Just give the audio portion of your video as much attention as you give to the visual portions. We're here to talk about the future of video. Now, there's no question technology is changing everything, but where is video headed? Well, it turns out video is going the way of the rest of the media. Video is going digital. Instead of storing a signal as a smoothly changing voltage, a digital system turns it into a series of numbers. Basically, it analyzes the waveform thousands of times per second and takes a measurement. It assigns numbers to these measurements and stores the numbers. You may not realize it, but you're probably already familiar with digital technology in the form of the compact disc. Now, CDs haven't been around all that long, but people sure didn't waste any time catching on to the advantages of digital. To prove my point, let's drop into this record store. Hmm, look at all those CDs. Well, we've scoured the store and found countless CDs, a handful of cassettes, and absolutely no vinyl records. It appears that digital audio is here to stay. And you know the advantages that help digital audio also help digital video. And those are, number one, quality. CDs sound better, and digital video tends to look better. Second, you have instantaneous access to any part of the disc that you want. Same with digital video. You don't have to wait for a tape, be it cassette or videotape, to shuttle. Third, when you're copying from digital to digital, there's absolutely no generation loss. Now, that should interest you video makers. Actually, digital video has been around for a while in some forms. Take this video mixer, for example. This unit di actually digitizes the video signal, but just temporarily, long enough to perform a given effect. Just face it, effects like these, that's enough, John, I'm getting dizzy. Effects like these just can't be performed with traditional analog video. Some camcorders also digitize the video signal, but just long enough to apply special processing or achieve some kind of effect. Now, why aren't more things digitizing video and storing them? Well, the problem is storage. Digital video takes a lot of room. Nowadays, we can store them on hard drives, but that's just now become practical. I remember my first hard drive. It was about the size of a shoebox, and it held only five megabytes of data. For the kind of video you're looking at right now, that would be roughly three seconds. Today's hard drives hold many gigabytes. This one, for example, holds 1.7 gigabytes, which is about 20 minutes of digital video. You know, analog editing is a bit like this typewriter. You only get to see your work when it's in its final form, and once you do, you really can't easily go back and change things. If I want to move a paragraph on this page, I'm out of luck. Digital video editing gives you the kind of cut and paste control you have with words and a word processor. Once you use a word processor to arrange your text, you'll never go back to a typewriter. And once digital video editing packages become as affordable as, say, this home computer, why analog editing is going to seem as archaic and clumsy as the old typewriter. So the greatest advantage of digital video comes when you're editing. With traditional analog tape-based editing, you're basically copying a scene from one VCR to another. You have to wait for the tapes to queue up to find the scene you want. It's basically a laborious process. Once you commit your scene to tape, it's kind of stuck there. Not so with digital editing. I've got all my scenes loaded on the hard drive, each one being represented by a picture icon or a picon. To build my production, I simply drag a PyCon onto what's called a timeline. I can resize it to change that scene's length. I can grab a new scene and place it onto the timeline. Grab a title, put it on. A dissolve or any other transition, as simple as laying it onto the screen, telling the unit what it's going to transition to and from, and that's it. I can make as many changes as I want instantly, view them right off without having to commit anything to tape. 
So today's camcorders don't actually store video digitally, but they're going to soon. There are two new designs coming down the pike that are going to change the way camcorders record forever. The first one uses a digital videotape about this size. This little guy is going to store two hours of HDTV quality video. The second one is a camcorder that uses a hard drive. A hard drive pack actually plugs on the back just like a battery would. When it's full, you remove it from the camcorder and plug it directly onto your computer. Who knows, someday we may be recording video on biochips and camcorders will have no moving parts whatsoever. But whatever the future of video, you can bet it's digital.